You know, you'd think I did that uh, on purpose, uh, you know, making, waiting until the the music ended, but uh, yeah, no, it just happened to be that way. So, hello everybody, welcome back, uh, it's Brian, I'm streaming again this week, uh, you know, trying to do, trying to do my, my hours on, on Twitch so I can build our, build our community here. So, uh, for those of you who didn't get a chance to visit with us last night, uh, our CSEC East, our virtual meetup that we do out of Seattle, is, uh, did very well. Uh, you know, we had a lot of attendees, a lot of chat, uh, people in chat, a lot of useful, uh, links. Uh, one of the things that I tend to do, at least on the podcast is create uh, a show note, a, a Google doc, if you will, uh, that our guests can add links to or create, you know, tables or, or, you know, diagrams that then we put in the show notes. And uh, CSEC East was no exception. There were there were several people who had input about various things, and we added uh, items on there for uh, for their consumption. So if you go back through and you watch the CSEC East video, I think it's about two hours. Normally, our our virtual meetups last anywhere between an hour and a half to two hours. And uh, you know, we were helping a couple of folks who are trying to get into the infosec community. Uh, you know, they are currently between jobs. Uh, but they're looking to upskill and, you know, doing things like trying to set up a SIM, which is a, uh, for, for those of you who are not in the know, a SIM is a, uh, a mechanism by which enterprises uh, connect and uh, store logs. And you can make queries on those logs and, you know, do things. So it's uh, information and event manager. So you'll take, um, you know, workstations in your environment. Windows, Linux, whatever, uh, you know, take those logs on the system, pass them across the network to the SIM. They get ingested. Um, usually the logs are in somewhat of a um, not unified format. So the SIMs also do normalization where they, you know, break down the, the, the logs into a, a useful format so that you can... Uh, you know, do queries against them, look for various things like indicators of compromise, or, um, you know, if somebody is, you know, if there's malicious activity on your network or congestion, or you have app logs that are not uh, playing right, usually, uh, and if we ever, when we get Miss Berlin on the show, uh, you know, on the podcast show, uh, you know, we'll, you know, we can always talk to her about that. She, she's, she's amazing at, at log correlation and analysis so um, we actually did a series of episodes with her company last year uh, uh, Blue Marisec um, on uh, log correlation you know c collecting logs what to collect things you shouldn't collect you know log all the things is a bad idea because there's a lot of noise that gets uh, created by uh, operating systems so yeah um, you know I, I think uh, one of one of the gentlemen was trying to set up a sim, so we um, uh, discussed. Uh, I think one of our one of our our followers uh, who had RSVP mentioned Detection Lab from Chris Long. So it's a it's a nice lab environment you can set up uh, that you can you know uh, create and quickly build a Windows domain. It uses Vagrant and Packer. Uh, so, you know, you're ideally it, it does all the secret sauce and the recipes for you by, you know, opening and deploying it. Um, Vagrant's, Vagrant and Packer have been around for a while. I want to say they have been around since before even Docker was a huge thing. I could be wrong on that. I uh, just uh, don't don't quote me on that. But um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, interesting items on here. You've got the uh, Microsoft Advanced and Threat Analytics installed on the WEF machine, which is uh, like Windows Enterprise Framework, I think is what WEF is. I could be wrong. I'll have to go look that up. Uh, I, I get into I get into rabbit holes. So let me see. WEF. WEF. Doink. Hopefully that's not something that's going to get me banned. No, it's not the World Economic F Foundation. Oh my hell. Okay. WEF Windows. Windows Event Forwarding. Ah, there you go. Windows Event Forwarding. Got my acronyms all, all messed up. So, uh, but yeah, those are uh, those are great. Uh, so yeah, and then it uh, installs the Windows Event Forwarding subscriptions and custom channels implementation. OS queries installed. 
Uh, Sysmon is installed and configured using uh, Olaf Hartong's uh, open source Sysmon config, which is great. Zeke and Circata are also pre-configured to monitor and alert on traffic. And you can look at all of your hosts using Apache Guacamole. So some of these things I hadn't heard of. I hadn't heard of Guacamole before, so... Uh, might be a might be might be useful for stream. Some of the I also asked uh, you know about you know because stream is new and you know I want this to be useful for folks who are trying to learn security. Uh, we're not always going to be you know playing uh, you know doing security here. I've already thought about some potentially non-security things that we could do here, uh, just you know in case people are just coming to you know entertain themselves. Uh, security is not always an entertaining proposition. Education is you know sometimes boring so sometimes it'll be good to you know make a break from that so we're we're thinking of other things um uh, backdoors and breaches which is a card game created by uh black hills information security uh, we've thought about maybe doing some sessions of that with some folks uh, i have one called cia called collect it all it was a game that was kickstarted by tech dirt and it was based on an open source uh manual of CIA training. So they created like a card game uh, based on things that could happen. There's scenarios inside and you, you play your cards in your hand based on uh, what resources you have, whether it be SIGINT or HUMANT or uh, what have you. And uh, hopefully you come out with a good, uh, a good outcome. So uh, that'll be something we could potentially look at as well. So, um, but yeah, um, person, person wanted to, to find a good way of setting up a SIM. And so there was a, we, we, uh, detection lab was mentioned. Uh, there was also a video that was also mentioned, but yeah, go back, go back and watch, uh, the CSEC East stuff. Uh, you know, we, um, it was fairly lighthearted, very much kind of like conversation like we normally do. Um, maybe next month I'll find a speaker if we can get somebody, if you're interested in speaking about a topic. I mean, um, I'm, I'm fairly, you know, liberal about the, the topics that we have, uh, project management, development, coding, if you've got, uh, you know, if you've got a 25 minute discussion with a 15 minute demonstration, that'll work too. I'm all, I'm all in on that. We can definitely screen share and do whatever uh, you'd like to, uh, um, you know, get your point across and to educate people. That's, that's what we're all about here. So, um, all right. So, uh, yeah, go check that out. If you're, uh, you know, you've got a home lab and you just, you know, have, have some spare CPU cycles. You want to bust out a uh, detection lab or anything like that. So, uh, go check that out. So, um, you know, got some news. Uh, according to Gordon Lawson, universities should prepare for attacks. Um, uh, you know, one second, I'm going to shut my door. So you can't see it, but obviously this is an overlay. It's not the earth, but yeah, I'm in my office here, so... Um, we just, we just did a series of podcasts on education and security. Um, we, we had, uh, Doug Levin and Eric Langford on talking about, uh, their ISAC or their information sharing, um, exchange that they have. Actually it's K6, K12-6. So, um, uh, security information exchange, I think I, IX. So, um, yeah, uh, We've been doing podcasts for a while, and we did a, um, at our conference, Emphasis at Campout, we had a speaker by the name of April Mardock, and April is the CISO of Seattle Public Schools, which it's, it's kind of a huge deal, um, you know, uh, considering, you know, the, the, the environment that, uh, you know, education and, and, and folks work in. And, you know, we got to talking, and, you know, one of the things that uh, that that I found out, because uh, I was I was interested in all the stories about ransomware of uh, high schools and elementary schools and and school districts and and what have you, and um, you know, she she told me some very stunning things, and and not not about Seattle Public Schools, but just education in general. You know, um, I, I've mentioned once or twice that I did audits for hospitals and, you know, in the six months that I was doing those audits, I learned a lot about how hospitals, um, I wouldn't say kowtow to certain, certain groups of people in, in the, in the organization. But, um, you know, when a, when a doctor at a small hospital system wants to use their iPod or their i tablets or, or their i devices or, you know, uh, you know, this electronic device, because it's cool. Uh, hospitals tend to, 
give them that kind of deference. Uh, and because it's hard enough to find doctors who will work at smaller hospital systems. Uh, and at least this is the case and it's been, wow, almost eight years, uh, but I, you know, um, just going in and, and checking out some of these healthcare systems was, was eye opening, and, and not, not because, uh, they were horribly insecure. Um, you know, I was helping them get ready for HIPAA and high trust audits and, and, and things at the time. So, you know, I had specific guidelines that I was following, but, um, you know, they, they are there to save lives and anything that gets in the way of doing that is considered like lower priority. So, you know, it's like, we want to save lives. And this was way beyond before the pandemic. So, um, I'm sure that that is, is like, you know, 100%, you know, we're all about saving lives, um, you know, and, and we'll do what we can, but yeah, you know, there, there were, you know, the, the thing I got with April was, if they hire a security person or if they hire uh, somebody to that isn't a teacher in this case, uh, that's one less teacher that they can hire. Uh, and, uh, you know, they 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 have other um, barriers where, you know, you're getting not paid very well, potentially, you know, you're, you know, teachers get paid X number of dollars and everybody, I, I would say a good consent. There's a, there's a consensus that maybe teachers don't get paid what they're worth. And, uh, you know, that, that is kind of indicative of the whole system. So you're going to have security people that, well, I can go, you know, be a, be a senior sock analyst over here at X company, even if it isn't a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Google or a, a, a Fang position, I can get, you know, $175,000 for being a sock analyst or something. I did it's not real money here. I'm just, you know, throwing out numbers. They won't get anywhere near that potentially at a, at a, at a, at a health, uh, not a healthcare, but a, an education system because they, they don't think about like that. And, you know, um, April was mentioning that, you know, you train people up, you almost have to assume that at a certain point they get enough training and get enough knowledge that they can take that and go work somewhere else. So there's a lot of turnover it, once somebody is gets skilled up. It's just the nature of the game. Um, so I'm I'm not surprised that universities should be preparing for attacks. Um, you know, like like it says here, open learning and collaboration. Um, I, I believe that I had seen a, a Twitter thread. <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't want to go looking for it because I probably will find it, but, um, there was a CISO who had replied to one of my friends about, um, how their network is set up and, and was called out because they pretty much don't have network controls or anything into place. It's pretty much a flat network across like 30, 40,000 devices. So you get past, you know, it, it, it's not even a, it's not even an egg in this case, in terms of the security model where they have a, you know, a, a hard outside and a really gooey, icky center, um, you know, because the adage is it's an egg, a coconut, or a brick, you know, that kind of thing. So it's like really thin veneer and then really crunchy or really icky inside. Uh, you know, the, the, the coconut's a little bit more. It's got a couple more layers. You know, it's a bit harder, and then it's still got a, nothing in the middle, you know, that kind of thing. And then the brick is is solid throughout. Um but yeah, I mean, the, the the person pretty much outed themselves saying, oh, well, you know, if, if, if we took the time to put in ACLs for our entire network, uh, nothing would ever get done. We have 40,000 devices. So, you know, we can't we can't take the time to actually do that because it's not realistic. And then uh, she basically said, you don't, you know, you you get one infection and people can move laterally across 40,000 devices. I think I think the person deleted that uh uh, the, the, the CISO of that, that educational facility, uh, deleted the tweet mentioning it. So, uh, hopefully they were not, uh, not outed, but yeah, it does, it, it paints a big target on them. So in this case, yeah, they say the threat's not theoretical, uh, UCSF, UC San, uh, San Fran paid a million point one point one million to regain access to research data, which that's, that's a huge deal, you know, especially if it's related to the coronavirus vaccine. Um, Emma, no, not MIT, University of Massachusetts at Lowell, 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 shut down totally for almost a week. Oh, let's go read that one. That sounds interesting. 
as classes resume at UMass Lowell after cyber attack, MIT cybersecurity experts weigh in. Okay. Uh, University of Massachusetts resumed classes after cybersecurity incident. They had a breach. Uh, they talked about solar winds in the Colonial Pipeline. And yeah, MIT Sloan School of Management. Oh, so all they all they just said was there was a breach or something. So okay, interesting. Okay, so yeah, turning the table in cyber criminals obfuscation is one of the most important weapons in the arsenal of cyber criminals. They don't want to be detected while they're attempting to carry out an exploit. But now technology is available allow colleges and universities to use obfuscation as a defensive weapon by anonymizing activities and assets. They can protect people data and applications from cyber threats at the network level by making themselves invisible. I don't have a problem with security by obscurity. As a matter of fact, we did uh, a whole show on security through obscurity or by, uh, by obscurity uh, where, you know, we talked about things like, you know, running your web servers on odd ports or, you know, changing services. You've got exposed to the internet on, on, on different ports it's not going to stop an attacker. Uh, obscure, you know, being, being obscure about something is not going to stop an attacker. Um, it will make things, I wouldn't say more difficult, but you know, it's security through obscurity should not be your only control. Uh, there, there can be other things going on. I mean, you can, you know, you could, you know, run your web server on port 445 and run a honeypot on port 443 if there's a vulnerability out there. So you know, people scanning the web will see port 443 because that's what people will scan for because that's the, the TLS or uh, HTTPS uh, port du jour for uh, web servers normally. Uh, they'll find that. They'll find a nice juicy what looks like a web server that's not patched and they'd be less likely to go, well, let's go and scan the rest of the IP address range or, um, you know, hey, what else is on this? You know, and they'll find... Uh, 443 and they'll attempt to you know poke around on it and then give you an early warning system uh, potentially to say oh somebody's attacking web server they're using this attack yeah we knew about this assuming you're involved in threat intelligence and uh, you know uh, uh, prepare your port 445 uh, specifically I don't think you want to run port 445 that one sounds vaguely familiar let me go and double check port Yeah, GRC, Shields Up. Yeah, Microsoft Directory. Okay, I, I, yeah, I got that. I got that dorked. Okay, so yeah, you wouldn't want to run port. <laughs> actually, port 445 would actually be worse. So don't don't listen to me uh, in, in that respect. You you might move it to, to a less popular port or you might run it on 32,000, you know, uh, 405 or something like that. Um, you know, you might, you might put it in a, in a higher port so that, you know, you can, uh, maybe catch the warnings of, of, you know, somebody scanning for 43 or 80 or 8080 or 8088 or whatever. Um, you can do that for anything. So if you have, you know, SSH running, you know, you wouldn't run it on port 22. Uh, you know, a mature IT environment may run an SSH honeypot there and put your, you know, your SSH port on like 1022 or something like that. Or, uh, no, you need 1024, so that would still be a restricted port, so you'd want to put it on like 8022 or something like that. Uh, let me see. <clears throat> what are they asking for for obscurity? When individuals engage in simplest online activity, they leave a footprint that includes your IP address and network identity. Okay, that's fair. The, this information can form the basis for an attack. Obfuscation at the network layer eliminates these footprints and makes hacking practices such as tracking cookies, browser fingerprinting, and device characterization virtually impossible okay i guess so um yeah software defined networking that's it that's an interesting concept we we've, we've done a few shows on sdn virtualization um yeah opening ports using code to open ports on uh on your your system kind of like a upnp or something but yeah um, data protection academic institutions are at the forefront of cybersecurity research need to perform their work in isolated environments and mitigate the risk of data theft and ransomware. I would argue that if your security research is so important that you need to be in an isolated environment, your network should also be isolated as well. And, you know, do proper data handling like encryption and 
uh, you know, backups and, you know, don't let somebody walk in with a Britney Spears CD and, you know, pull data off of your skiff and then walk out with it. Uh, secure communications. There you go. I, global I, collaboration is central to many academic research projects and maintaining privacy is a higher priority. Know who you're talking to, you know, find, find throwaway VMs. Hmm, okay. Uh, secure communication. Yeah. I mean, if, if your stuff is important, you may not want to make regular phone calls. You may not want to use SMS. You may want to use something like Signal or WhatsApp with, you know, um, you may even want to do like ephemeral messaging. So you send the message and in 30 seconds it gets deleted, uh, uh, depending on how the level of, of trust there. So um, I throw away VMs means, uh, okay, burner V, okay, burner VMs. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that quite a bit where uh, you use them and you throw them away. Um, uh, that's, that's not difficult. I mean, you can clone a VM, start it up, do whatever it is you need to do and, and quit. Um, a lightweight VM, like a like a Linux-based VM, if all you're needing to do is do some light web surfing or something, is always helpful to do that. You can, uh, you know, do that with uh, VirtualBox or uh, VMware or Parallels, or uh, you could even do it in a Linux container, I guess, if you wanted to, or a Docker instance, if you wanted to build a Docker VM that would just boot up with a with a web server, uh, web web browser. So yeah, you could do that. <clears throat> Avoiding the arms race. There's currently what amounts to an arms race between cyber criminals and their victims. Okay, yeah, that that's that's pretty much correct. Um, yeah, I had a different version of what obfuscation is. I mean, obfuscation would be like using codes or something like that. But I mean, yeah, I mean he he's he's correct. The thing is, he see yes, his he's the CEO of a company that specializes in network privacy, non-attribution and obfuscation for enterprises worldwide. So that's one thing you have to remember about these news articles. Uh, the only thing he didn't do in the last paragraph was let, you know, let net abstraction tell you about how you can be better off at net network obfuscation. So, I mean, some of these are thinly veiled, you know, discussions uh, that just turn out to be ads. So it's just, Something to think about when you're you're reading some of these news articles on these websites. Let me see what else did I have put up here. Oh yeah, this one this one makes me kind of icky because uh, I've I've been in a hospital not myself as a patient but as somebody who's seen a lot of hospital uh, work. So uh, Palo Alto has collected data from medical fusion pubs. Ooh, ooh man, goodness. Uh, used to administer medicines and fluids. So I, I, we're talking like IV pumps or, or what have you. Uh, research revealed tens of thousands of devices are vulnerable to six critical security flaws that are 9.8 out of 10 reported in 2019-2020, leaving them open to attack. So that's that's quite interesting. Let me go. Let's go see. Let's go read and see if the report is available. Okay. Well, here's a bleeping... Okay, so... <laughs> So, IT security guru links to a bleeping computer article, uh, and wait, so they said 200,000, and bleeping computer says it's actually over 100,000, so, I'll, I bet the data was collected for more than 200,000, okay, so, that that's good, okay, so that, that, that is a little, little thing here, so, most prevalent security, critical security flaw was 2019-12255, memory corruption bug in the VxWorks real-time operating system, okay, for embedded devices, okay, yeah, including fusion pump systems. Let's go see what that one says. There's a buffer overflow, oh, bow, 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 yep, in the TCP, yep, in the, yep, okay. So Wind River VX Works is a fairly popular embedded OS for IoT devices. Uh, the overflows in the TCP component. So this is, uh, yeah, this is a supply chain issue. You know, uh, TCP urgent pointer equals zero leads to an integer underflow. Okay, good times. Yep, those are. Um, yeah, you know, those are those are painful because it, it affects Sonic Wall, it affects NetApp, it affects VXWorks, WinDriver, 
there's just a lot of a lot of things that tend to use this uh, Siemens uh, CyProtect firmware power meters ICS related items um, yeah so yeah um, we also did a show they called it they called it Ripple 20 uh, Ripple 20 and it was a list of vulnerabilities yeah the JSOF team uh, had found uh, we actually interviewed the, the folks that helped write this Ripple 20 thing. There were actually 19 vulnerabilities, but 19 was too wordy, so they just called it Ripple 20. Uh, there were actually more than 20 findings, I think, if memory serves. But yeah, they talked about all the affected uh, TCP IP libraries, which um, are in you know things like industrial devices, power grids, medical devices, enterprise devices, oil and gas, pretty much everywhere there's an embedded device or system that needed to be up for 20 years and will probably never get patched. Um, memory serves, uh, the JSOF folks had talked about the fact that the company that made the TCP IP stack created licensing for the Japanese firm that it was using. So there's actually like three different variants or three different versions of the same TCP library out there being used by thousands of companies in these industries. So you could see one version of the TCP IP stack or the Japanese version of the TCP IP stack, but some of this stuff is like 30 years old and have not been patched. Um, and that, that goes back even almost to the early days of Windows at this point. So... Um, but yeah, they, uh, they, they, they had a, a good discussion with us on this. So yeah, all these advisories by Aruba, Baxter, CareStream, Caterpillar, Mitsubishi, Intel, HP, HPE, Schneider Electric. That was a big one. Uh, Rockwell, Xerox, Cisco. Yeah. I mean, all of them, they, yeah. So this, uh, the, I think, I, I don't want to say this, this shined a light on supply chain vulnerabilities and supply chain security, but it, it, it definitely got the ball spotlit onto that. So, um, yeah, that'd be my neighbors. There you go. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it definitely showed that there was a major issue there and that, uh, it needs to be, it needs to be fixed. And then, wow, this was August, 2020. So this was, uh, they, I don't know if they spoke at black hat 2020. I don't know if black hat 2020 existed that year. So, um, but yeah, that was a, that was an interesting discussion. So yeah, buffer overflows in s software libraries that never get updates. Always solid for vulnerabilities and rife, rife with issues that will probably never get fixed because who's going to, who's going to notify the company? I think that's, we, we asked that question. It was like, how did you get a hold of the company to let them know there were vulnerabilities? And it was like, um, there was, it was very hard to just track all the way back to those various places. Uh, and, and to get to the actual manufacturer who created the library. And, and in many cases, they're no longer supporting that library. So there's no good way to update that. Um, it's, it's pretty much into life, into service. So, anywho. All right, so here are the lists in the Baxter products. Uh, Baxter International. Okay, so it's just the Baxter. Um, so if you're in a hospital right now watching this stream and you have an IV pump or an infusion pump sitting next to you and it says Baxter on it, you're probably, uh, you know, th these are waiting. These are sitting on a hospital network, by the way, uh, which as I told you before, you know, you know security. Uh, all five of these have a, a 9.8 rating on them, which are uber critical. So uh, it goes out of 10. So, you know, we're, we're edging up against that, uh, that, let's see, what is it? Baxter Spectrum WBM when used with a Spectrum VA. Okay, so there's, okay, yeah, factory default wireless configuration enables FTP service with hard-coded credentials. Oh, gods, look at that. There we are. By the way, FTP is, for those of you who are, you know, new to security, FTP was a file transfer protocol. That's what FTP stands for, uh, which has been around since... How does Obi-Wan say that? FTP's been around since long before you were born or something like that. It's That's going on about 40, 45 years. I mean, I'm only 42, and I think FTP's been around for a long time. Um, it got better. There, There's less 
I would say FTP is still around, but it's not nearly as ubiquitous as it used to be. Um, you know, a lot of, lot of organizations are now using, uh, you know, if they're using FTP, it's over an SSL or a TLS connection, uh, or they've moved on to, you know, something like a, a Google Drive or something like that. But I mean, it's still around in some places, but it's, it's completely unencrypted. So the hard-coded credentials, once you've gotten that, you have complete FTP access to the box. And the fact that it's hard-coded means that I doubt they can easily fix that uh, or change the, 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 the credentials that are inside there. Um, a lot of times you end up with test credentials that have been left in at, or they weren't scrubbed properly when the, uh, the software was uh, sent out. So, yeah. Um, so any of our any of our listeners, any of our streamers, uh, users here have any questions about uh, you know any of the stories here? I, I keep talking, but you know, kind of expect folks to you know come in and ask questions. Uh, you know anything that interests you, anything that bothers you about the uh, the security on these things. Any questions about buffer underruns or integer underruns or buffer overflows? I'm going to have to get used to the silence, I think, at some point. So it's okay. It's okay. All right. <clears throat> Uh, oh, Baxter put out a security bulletin. Good. So they they actually, I'm sure it starts out with, yes, uh, our, okay, the following vulnerabilities were identified in the Spectrum Infusion system. Let me make this a little bigger and more readable for everybody. Oh, they sent this out in 2020. Wow, that's that's a bit old. I guess that's when they, oh, they were reported in 2020. So maybe they've, I don't know if they've been fixed or not. So it's hard because, you know, again the hospitals they're there to save lives if they run a patch they're going to be super it's going to be super risky you know you run a patch that bricks 500 infusion pumps now you can't help 500 people so i mean i i get it it's like you can't turn that around like that you know and then of course there's still hospitals that believe uh that they would fall afoul of certain fda certification guidelines like oh we can't update the you know the, the system connected to our ct scanner because we'll lose there's there's still some kind of uh urban legend that that's the case the government has put out you know guidance on that saying yes we actually really want you to fix this you're not going to bust your fda approvals or um not fda but um your medical your medical certifications or approvals for the devices the medical devices that you're using have to go through regular certifications um and you know if if a company patches them there's there was the thought back in the day that it would actually cause them to uh not not uh, maintain their their certification so um palo alto recommends healthcare providers of course Adopt a proactive security strategy for keeping devices safe from unknown and known threats with an accurate inventory of all systems on the network. Uh, you may also need to do some kind of network isolation. Uh, you know, VLANs could still be a thing. Uh, I doubt a lot of hospitals are, you know, put their infusion pumps on the cloud. Uh, so, I mean, you may want to look at, you know, if you're using the telemetry on those, you may want to put them in their own managed network. Uh, outside or away from other machines, you know, don't put them on your guest Wi-Fi, for instance, uh, or uh, connect them to the larger Wi-Fi network. You, you kind of want to have a lot of segmentation built in, especially for these kinds of devices, which is very difficult to fix. So, but that's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, we won't see the end of medical device uh, vulnerabilities for a long, long time because... There are still devices out there that, you know, they need those CT scanners. And the last thing they want to do is run an update that might break their CT scanner or cause their CT scanner to no longer function or worse, um, you know, an x-ray machine or something that would, you know, change the settings in some way that would actually harm a patient uh, where, you know, you're not you have an off by 10x error or something so you give somebody an x-ray with 10x the amount of radiation that they should be getting or something i mean any, any number of things so 
Um, you don't have a spare CT scanner sometimes to go and test patches on before you deploy them. So I, I completely understand. I completely understand. I found this one fun, Daily Swig. It's um, Port Swigger, uh, who makes Burp Suite, has a new service. And um, uh, they actually put some good, good stories on there. So this one's from the Daily Swig. Uh, NVIDIA hackers have apparently completely owned up NVIDIA. Uh, their first demand, I think we might have talked about this earlier, they said they wanted, uh, what was it? They wanted to remove mining hash rate limiters on RTX 3000 series graphics cards, presumably either to make it easier to mine crypto, uh, crack passwords, which, you know, you've got hashes, you've got passwords. Um, and, oh, I got this guy over here. I don't know what that's going on with this guy, but um, the hacking group Lapsus dollar sign Lapsuses Lapsus. I don't know what the dollar sign means. It's probably an emoji thing that I don't get. Uh, claims responsibility. They have a terabyte of data. <laughs> Wait, so they've they've found some way to export a terabyte worth of data. I I guess that's not a lot for a company like. Nvidia, I mean, you know, that's what one one Call of Duty update or uh, whatever you kids are playing these days. Um, one terabyte of data last week issued a ransom demand. Remove the mining hash rate limiters. Yeah, so they they're they're looking to do things like um, uh, you know increase the ability for Ethereum currency mining uh, or uh, fixing. Uh, uh, close that window right there. Sorry, that was my Slack. Sorry, y'all. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, they want to increase cards available for gamers during the peak of pandemic. Many were snapped up for crypto mining. Uh, so they, I guess NVIDIA added the, the hash rate limiter to make them less appealing for crypto miners. They were hoping to get away from that, but um, there's some video cards for you if you enjoy looking at video cards. Um, so yeah, uh, and then of course they, they went one step further. They said, we, um, all, we want all your drivers. So give us all of your drivers, open it up to free and open source, uh, uh windows, Linux, Mac, etc. If you don't, bad things are going to happen. We're going to leak all your data, including your, um, you know, chipset files for the 3090 TI and and what have you so okay uh, right hold on i'm talking to a friend of mine um that i had actually suggested uh apply for a position and she's she's asking me if people want to get into infosec but i was like Education doesn't appeal, you know, isn't isn't all that exciting to people who are Twitch streaming, so, or who 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 want to watch Twitch streams. So, you know, trying to figure out what kind of carrot will get people to come and listen and, and to the to the show would be great. Um, you have to drive visitors, viewers, viewers. I'd love to hear them. I'm streaming right now and chatting with you. LOL. LOL uh, via Lucifer our Lord or whatever, whatever it is. Anyway, so um, yeah, they want to completely open source and uh, under a FOS license for, uh, you know, their, their GPU drivers. And the problem with that is, um, I, I, you know, it's great. It would be nice to have. I could definitely see that being a thing. Um, uh, there are open source NVIDIA drivers, uh, as somebody who has used, um, OpenBSD, which is a, uh, it's a Unix operating system that's been around for, I don't know, 30 years. Uh, they created a completely clean room implementation of what's called the Nouveau driver. I believe they implemented it, um, the, the idea was, you know, back in the day, uh, OpenBSD did not like things called blobs, which are binary level operating bits. Uh, basically, it's an EX, a DLL or an EXE file that is created for um, 
you know, Linux that you can run the device drivers for. And uh, NVIDIA did not have a good driver. They had one, but it was pretty much you download the driver, you import it in as a kernel driver or something, you run it, but you can't do anything with it. You know, you it, it, it runs as is, and if there's a problem, you can't troubleshoot that or debug that uh, outside of hoping that when you throw one plus one in on this side and it goes through the driver or the software or the code, you get two on the other side. Uh, the problem is you put one plus one here, it goes through the driver and comes out as 17. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. What, 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 what the hell, what the, what the hell? So they painstakingly created the Nouveau driver by just continually putting in input on one side and seeing what would come out the other side. And, um, you know, it was great. And they've had about, I would say, 10 plus years of development on it. And the, the problem that I've seen, and somebody had mentioned this in our Slack channel, if they open source this, these drivers, if NVIDIA said, okay, you win, we're making, you know, hand over fist money on the hardware itself, the drivers are nothing and actually would help us speed adoption. Okay, great. We'll send out an open source. You know, we'll, we'll put it out there in GPL2 or you know, GPL three or whatever it is, you know, here's an open source, here's the source code, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, that would wreck the other version of the, the driver because you couldn't make changes to Nouveau without it, you know, cons you know, somebody arguing the point that, well, they looked at the source over here or something like that. It would be harder for them to prove that this was a clean room implementation uh, driver, Nouveau, uh, and, and that would, that would make it uh, more difficult. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, back to the story at hand, uh, the actors have already claimed to have leaked password hashes for NVIDIA employees as well as source code and highly confidential information. Uh, the operators have also accused of NVIDIA of hacking back. Ooh, okay. So that's, that's a thing. Oh, here's a Twitter. Here's a, let me see what the, what did the Twitter people say here? Let's see. We have, Brett Callow, Lapis, claims responsibility for hack on NVIDIA, also claims they've hacked back. And woke up and found NVIDIA scum had attacked the machine with malware. Luckily, they ha it had a backup, but why the F? Uh, okay, so that was, that was, I apologize for the language there. Hackers tend to, you know, talk, talk with a salty tongue, if you will, so... Um, yeah, so, I mean, I don't think NVIDIA is going to cave on this, but I, I want, I think somebody had mentioned in this article, it's, it's one of the rare times that you actually see hackers, uh, or ha you know, people who have hacked and, 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 and taken this data and not wanted money, um, not wanted, this is completely, it almost sounds altruistic, but removing the hash rate limiters, on the 3000 series graphics cards would make it easier to mine Ethereum, like they said, uh, or, you know, they do things like potentially ha uh, crack passwords, et cetera. So uh, what have we got going on over here? They have the answer to the question. Yeah, okay, yeah. I have a late meeting with uh, non-US entities in about 30 minutes. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was available. Okay. All right. So yeah. Um, if you have a 3060, you know, this may be something you're interested in, especially if you're keeping yourself warm on this uh, nice, you know, you live up in the Northeast where it's, you know, 20 degrees and you're inside your house and you're trying to keep your house warm, you know, and you're mining Bitcoin or Ethereum. So yeah, since, yeah, see, they introduced the limiters after the launch of the 3060, which was the first introduced limiter, although it was circumvented with a leaked driver. Since then, though, third-party 3000 series cards have had hard, hard, it looks like hard lock mining performance. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, um, <laughs> they can't get around, they can't get around the controls anymore, so they've taken to, you know, ransomware, you know, ransoming or blackmailing them for that. So there you go. Um, yeah. So yeah, lab was claim that was, yeah, it's fairly, fairly new and Latin America based threat group, which seems to lack the playbook of predictable strategies used by Russian or CIS Commonwealth of independent States based operations. And their OPSEC is also lacking. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Um, we can come back to that later. Pen tester lab. Okay, I had that too. Oh, so any of you hit by the hermetic ransom that uh, hit Ukraine, uh, Avast has created and released a decryptor. If you've been invited into the the ranks of malware, uh, ransomware, uh, hermetic ransom. Uh, it also let's see, hermetic ransomware was one of the three components involved in the in the disruptive attacks detailed by ESET researchers. Uh, hermetic Wiper makes the system inoperable by corrupting data. Hermetic Wizard spreads Hermetic Wiper across the local network via WMI or SMB. That's Windows, um, Windows instrumentation. Windows, God bless. <sighs> Windows management, that's right. Windows management instrumentation uh, or SMB, which is uh, uh, file shares and such. Uh, and Hermetic Ransom, ransomware written in the Go language. Good job, Go. Go, Go Lang there, yeah. So researchers from CrowdStrike, boy, they just got everybody on here. They got a VAST, we've got ESET, we've got some CrowdStrike folk. Um, so yeah, the researchers from CrowdStrike discovered a logic flaw in the encryption process that can allow researchers to break the encryption. So they're using trashy encryption. Huh, that's interesting, okay. Hmm, logic flaw, huh? I bet that's a nice write-up probably should read that if you have a chance to go check out some of these articles decryptable party ticket ransomware part targeting ukrainian entities uh, okay yeah this is gonna be good right up here so um this was from CrowdStrike intelligence team technical analysis they have a sha 256 hash associated with the observable the observable names of cdir.exe cname.exe conh.exe and intpub.exe ransomware sample written in go version 1.10.1 uh, many many symbols are referenced u.s political system uh, all of these yeah 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 it iterates over drive letters and recursively enumerates the files in each drive and subfolder including paths that contain strings windows and program files and folder path c documents and settings <coughs> So they select all of these for encryption. So these are all of the files, zip, rar, PPT, PNG, wave, VSD, VDI. Wow, that's a lot, okay. So yeah, you can go read that, that whole write-up. Uh, they do a pretty good job usually on these, on these blogs here. CrowdStrike blog, crowdstrike.com forward slash blog. So you can go check that out. And so, yeah, they, if you, if your company was hit by that or, um, uh, you know, might want to, might want to go check and see if Avast can, can hook you up. I mean, uh, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't they have detailed instructions to recover your data if you have been hit by that. It's sad, you know, so yeah, download the Avast decryptor. There it is. So Avast.io. Okay. Let me, uh. I'll put that in the chat window just, you know, so folks who need it can get it. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, final page, backup encrypted files. You can opt into whether you want to back up the encrypted files. These backups may help if anything goes wrong during the decryption process. That's, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, so there you go. Hmm. Okay. Oh wait, that was that was one of the ones that there we go. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see. We still have some users. Shy Puff, hey, C Pop Parker, any tau, another TTV viewer, and a AB Jewel. I think that's AB Jewel. Shy Puff Cax IPS06. Welcome, y'all. Glad you could uh, join me today. Uh, <clears throat> why are organizations getting zero trust wrong? I, I think the problem with zero trust is there's so many definitions of what it is versus what it. I think I think if you're wanting zero trust, you need to understand what the goal of your zero trust is, right? Preempting the issue surrounding the term. What does zero trust mean to you, and why do we need it? There you go. Um, <clears throat> yep. Oh, wow, boy. He 
through that gauntlet. It's a market invention, even if there are valuable things within a zero trust architecture, including authentication, authorization, and secure connections. Also stress the term is old, uh, relatively old. It's something we've been doing for years since cybersecurity industry started. I wonder how many of you would have a smaller definition of zero trust as the person's, how many of you would have a similar definition of the term zero trust for the person sitting next to you? I agree with Mark that zero trust has become a buzzword. For me, you know, for me, zero trust is I don't want to have to use a VPN, but I still want to be able to do everything it is I need to do to work. So, um, you know, I, how many of you can start up your work computer, log in to your computer and access everything you need at work without having a VPN or being physically at a office space to do so and do it in a secure manner, whether it be, oh, we use duo push or whatever. For me, that's, that's not zero trust, but it's, Again, I don't know what I don't know what the, the goal of zero trust is. Is it, you know, you're completely untrusted and you know you have to prove you are who you say you are, uh, or you know, for me, uh, I can access everything I need except for the ticketing system that we use uh, remotely, and I, I believe that there are plans in the works to make that possible because you know, the big thing is most of the time you need a VPN, which requires you to uh, stand up a VPN server or a cluster of VPN servers so that people can get in or jump boxes to be able to get in through network isolation. Uh, you know, if there's a bastion host or something like that, I mean, there's, uh, things that you have to do to go in and, and, and authenticate. And, um, you know, I think the idea behind zero trust is to reduce, uh, the number of steps needed to do something. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't think they should call it zero trust. I think there's, uh, I think you can call it zero. I think you can do what you want without calling it zero trust. I think it's just some kind of VPN less setup or, <clears throat> um, being able to access resources in a responsible manner with authentic authentication and authorization, just like the, uh, the person said. So, <clears throat> um, you know, if, if I am who I am and I can prove who I am through, a token or some kind of authentication push, uh, you know, and, you know, I'm supposed to be in this company and I'm supposed to be there and I can authorize it and it's done over a TLS connection. Let me in, you know? So there you go. Um, oh, yeah, the... Uh, White House, uh, um, uh, President Biden's uh, has a, an executive order that was made uh, May of last year about implementing certain things. I think we talked about that in our, I'm going to say we talked about that in our mid-2021 uh, area when that came out because they had like 18 months to get zero trust set up in the U.S. government. And I was like, oh my God, that's never going to happen. Um, <clears throat> trying to get that pushed out in, in, in a responsible way. It's, it's going to feel like the PKI stuff that I had to deal with back in 2003 when the U S Navy, you know, brought in NMCI, the Navy Marine Corps intranet. And one of the things they did was one of the most massive push outs of PKI. Now keep in mind, this was before, um, you know, 0365 before the rise of Amazon web services and, you know, cloud-based items, uh, you know, they were still using data centers and, and, and pushing things out that way. So, I mean, today, I mean, shoot, government stand up in 0365 and then you're done. I mean, that's, that's, that's how that would work. I mean, it would be an undertaking to migrate people over to, to my 0365, but I think the, ability to you know roll these things out without having to you know have people go and take their id cards and get them changed in for a, a common access card or something like that would be uh way better so <clears throat> uh just so uh, is anything else of note here let's see as lander drew attention to zero trust migration being a multi-year journey journey people are looking for a single button and uh, and I now have zero trust instead we have to think what zero trust means for the entire org and the benefits and build a multi-year plan to move to a zero trust model <clears throat> I think 
I think that's just me, uh, my thoughts, uh, as we had the disclaimer, uh, thoughts and opinions are not, uh, of the hosts past, present or future employers in this case. I, I think a good majority of companies, if they could figure out who their most, I wouldn't say difficult, but most complex users are, could set those people aside if they're trying to set up something like Zero Trust. Uh, depending on, you know, oh, well, this person has access to blah, blah, and blah. And yeah, we're, we're not going to roll it out to those areas yet. So these people will still be using typical uh, authentication mechanisms. But if it's like, these people, you know, the salespeople are, are off on their own network. They're doing their own thing. We can roll it out to them or the business development people or, you know, I'm of the opinion that some of the salespeople may not even or shouldn't need official company emails because it sets them up for potential, uh, you know, phishing attacks or what have you, you know, setting them up with something that is off the, the, the exchange domain or your 0365 domain uh, and isolated. And so when they get a, you know, an email, hey, you know, I want to buy 100,000 of your widgets, please click here. And they click on it and they own themselves up and then they start owning the rest of the domain. They're not going to take down the whole company with you. Uh, you know, you're, you've isolated them or their, their environment uh, and, and, and keeping, them, keeping them safe. So uh, just, you know, it's important to think about that, but I think a good majority of people who work at companies could be switched over fairly easily. There's always those outliers that you would have to um, work to to make those um, better. So, um, and you know, you would have to work to, you know, maybe maybe the people who are the most complicated to get into a, uh, a zero trust kind of implementation. Maybe you need to review their permissions and see if they actually need access to those things anymore or if they can get, you know, get away with it elsewhere. So, uh, the challenges we think in terms of checklists, you need to have antivirus firewall, etc. yet this doesn't show how these things should be implemented. That, that is a fair point. I mean, um, yeah, unfortunately something bad has to happen for orgs to realize that for example, antivirus isn't enough inadequately defining architecture opponents means threats will continue to occur. Okay, this was at, what is this, CCSE22. I wonder where the heck that is. It's cloud and cybersecurity in Excel London. Excel London, okay. I haven't heard of this before, so, but it looks like a, uh, looks like a very industry, ooh, yeah, the vendor pit just looked massive, yeah. Interesting, okay, so that, that was going on or went on. Uh, I'm assuming this was the end, last day of it since it says 2 to 3 March 2022. Cool, okay. Well, something to think about for next year, you know. We'll get get uh, get flying back. London's lovely, I'm sure, this time of year. So, All right, let me see. What else do we have? Um, okay, a vast. Um, we can go over that later. Um, <clears throat> okay, I think we're good. Uh one of the last things I wanted to do uh, before we before we signed off, uh, there were some ideas that uh, came up during our CSEC East meetup about things that we could do. Uh, one of the one of the gentlemen, Donald, had mentioned tool use, uh, and um, uh, somebody else had also mentioned, you know, I'm going through this class. We're doing a lot of stuff in Kali Linux, but how do you know which tool to use for these things? How do you know uh, if there's you know not a better tool to use? So. Some of the things we may look at in the, in the coming weeks will be like specific tools you can use to, to do things. Uh, you know, uh, I might spend a little time discussing certain command line tools. Um, study groups came up. Uh, somebody had mentioned, hey, I want to get my SysP or I want to get that. Uh, Security Plus, are there any good study groups out there? So um, they, they asked about the potential for study groups or book clubs or what have you. I don't have a problem with book club. I like book club. I think we could definitely do that. Uh, war games and CTFs. If, uh, you know, somebody wants to get on and do some hack the box, uh, or Vuln hub or something like that, where we can, uh, you know, find some, find some vulnerable VMs and, and hack all the things, uh, you know, we can do that. Um, the games backdoors and breaches was mentioned. The CIA thing I mentioned collect it all. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we can get somebody like, uh, Chris Long from do, who did the detection lab stuff we talked about earlier to, uh, 
come in and, uh, you know, maybe as a podcast or an extended podcast, uh, um, you know, demonstrate what Detection Lab does and how you can use it in your own home environment to learn how to make a better sim. So there you go. All right. Well, I've got about seven minutes until my next meeting uh, for my non-U.S. Uh, uh, colleagues. So I am going to bounce off here. If uh, you have any thoughts, uh, you know, please, uh, please reach out uh, on our, um, you know, we have Twitter. You can send a break sec uh, or you can send one to me at Brian Break. Uh, my colleagues, my co-host colleagues are Info Sister Amanda Berlin and Betcher Pwned Brian Betcher. And, um, you know, if you found value in this, the tip jar is, is a way you can do that. We do have Patreon, which we've had for several years. Uh, you can, you know, send us uh, some Patreon information, uh, you know, Patreon money. We'll, we'll take it, you know, if, uh, you know, one, two, three dollars, if you found value in this, or you just like to listen to me talk, you know, that's, I appreciate you for listening to me talk. And, uh, if you are looking for CPEs for your certifications, uh, the website right there, breaksec.com forward slash website, that's a bit.ly link that will take you directly to our breakingsecurity.com website. And uh, I think we've got about 400 plus episodes. Uh, if you if you are a brand new CISP, you only need 40 a year. So that would be, if I do math right, I think some of them are roughly, I think we're roughly about a 45 minute average on the podcast. So you're looking at about, you know, 250 CPEs on average. So um, if you're looking for stuff for your, your certifications, uh, definitely check those out. And technically, this counts as a CPE as well. This is one where one hour, six minutes, 22 seconds. And we talked about all kinds of security stuff here. So watching this is one CPE. So there you go. That's something else to think about as well. And you'll have a link. Uh, these will always be available. I'm going to post them up on our YouTube channel, which also has all of the, the videos, I think, back to 2017. Uh, Libsyn was automatically outputting them to YouTube by then. Um, so, yeah, once this is done, I'll output it to our, our – I'll make it, you know, post to our YouTube, and then you'll have a link there if uh, you ever get audited by, you know, by ISC or, or, or what have you. So I, I have, uh, I've used podcasts uh, to great, uh, um, to great, uh, you know, benefit for myself. Uh, Risky Business is one, Defensive Security is another. So if you are interested in looking for audio podcasts for whatever, your commute or what have you, uh, go check those out. So, all right, I'm out. I will talk to you tomorrow. And then Saturday, we're going to we're going to do something. Uh, I believe we're going to be doing a fundraising charity event for Nova, Nova Ukraine, which is a, uh, uh, they're supplying uh, humanitarian relief for people uh, hit and impacted by the war in Ukraine. Uh, you can actually go and donate at NovaUkraine.org. Uh, you can donate via PayPal. Uh, they'll actually take your crypto or you can do a facebook donate uh your companies may be doing matching right now so that's something to think about uh our my company is actually um up to i think five million dollars until the end of the month so if you have uh you know a couple hundred bucks make sure you give your receipt to your company so they can also match your funds if that's a, if that's a thing but if you have crypto and you uh, feel like you want to help out with humanitarian relief uh, uh to help uh, people from ukraine and uh as they uh, begin their diaspora, um, you can you know they'll they'll donate Bitcoin, USD coin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Dogecoin, or Dai. I think there was a couple of more, but I think they may have gotten rid of them. I don't know. Whatever whatever coin you can pay with Coinbase. So if you have a Coinbase account, you're solid. So there you go. Um, and I was told by Joe Gray that this is a this is a good org by people who are in in Ukraine. So uh, you can you can talk to them about that. But uh, Joe Gray and I have something going on Saturday uh, from at least 4 p.m. Pacific to 8 p.m. Pacific if you're interested. So there's there's definitely something that's going to happen. So yes, I want to cancel that payment. So hope uh, hope you uh, you know enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, we'll talk again soon.